Hello viewers and welcome to yet another special video production by Cardboard of the Rings, a bi-weekly podcast about the Lord of the Rings, the card game, which is a living card game by Fantasy Flight Games. This is Mitch, and joining me as always tonight is Matthew, if you'd like to say hello. Hello everyone. I say that this is going to be a special video just because now that we've actually managed to play through all the three different core set scenarios, uh, we'd like to take a little bit of a look at the player cards from the core set before we move on into some of our adventure packs. So in taking a look at all of those different player cards, it's important to keep in mind that there are four different spheres of influence in the Lord of the Rings, the card game, and each one has its own distinct flavor and identity. So Matthew, to kick off this new mini-series, what is the first sphere that we're going to be taking a look at? We'll be looking at the leadership sphere first, and this is a sphere that emphasizes the charismatic and inspirational influence of a hero. Uh, additionally, this sphere is sort of embodying the hero's potential to lead, to inspire, and to command allies and other heroes. So when I think of the leadership sphere in The Lord of the Rings, the card game, I think what comes to my mind first and foremost is... Um, resource generation. Unlike any other sphere in the game at this point, leadership is really great at generating more than just the one resource per hero during the refresh phase. Whether it's with attachments or hero abilities, uh, they're really good at getting cards onto the table faster. To me, this is sort of akin to a king in a kingdom or perhaps a leader of a band of adventurers scouring the countryside looking for any scrap that they can find, another extra ally, another piece of equipment that's going to help the adventurers accomplish their goal. Sure. Uh, I think, you know, cards like Steward of Gondor are great examples of resource acceleration and just the sheer potency of that card really helps to define leadership. Something else I kind of think about, uh, at least in the core iteration of leadership, is just versatility. Um, so yeah. generally, it's a lot of different characters that can do a lot of different roles, uh, not necessarily specializing in that, but more of a jack-of-all-trades, you know, so yeah. good at mm -hmm. some things, master at none uh, right. type sphere. <laughs> So, I suppose to kind of kick things off, why don't we go ahead and take a look at our very first hero card, which I think kind of symbolizes this concept of versatility very well. And that is, of course, Aragorn. Uh, he's a 12-threat hero with 2 willpower, 3 attack, 2 defense, and 5 hit points. He is a Dunedain noble and ranger, and he has the ability, uh, the trait sentinel. He's got the response, after Aragorn commits to a quest, you can spend one resource from his resource pool in order to ready him. So this speaks to being able to defend not only yourself, but you can reach across the table, defend any other player in the game, uh, and he's perfect for, you can not only just commit him to the quest, but you can also use him to defend, you can use him to attack. He's got a huge pool of hit points, so he's great for taking undefended attacks, and versatility, you know, personified is Aragorn. Um, I think overall, well, the first thing I think that's worth noting about heroes is something that I didn't actually realize for quite a while, and that's if you add their stats plus their hit points, that equals their threat cost, which is sort of interesting. Not all heroes follow that, that sort of model, but most of them do. So, of course, the better the stats, the higher the threat cost. I think that's the major drawback if you want to consider that one. Uh, to Aragorn is that starting at 12, in addition to the other two heroes you're probably playing with, will start you probably in the lower 30s. Otherwise, though, I mean, he has great stats. I think some of the better stats of heroes in the game. I think his ability is actually really good. If you watched our previous four videos, especially um, the last one, Escape from Dol Guldur, I think you saw Aragorn using his ability quite often and to great effect. Um, he also combos well, I think, with a couple of cards um, Theodred's a good card because if both Aragorn and Theodred come into the quest, Theodred gives Aragorn the resource, which then he has to ready himself. And then Calabrian Stone, of course, is sort of made for Aragorn. Uh, it even mentions him in the card text to give him extra willpower and then uh, also makes him part of the spirit sphere. So I think he's a great hero. He's underused, I think, in large part because of his high threat cost, but I think he's quite good. 
to uh, sure. quote Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely remember uh, some problems when I was trying to play Journey Along the Anduin uh, a year ago when I first opened up my core set and I had Aragorn trying to go up against the Hill Troll. He is very versatile, he's very useful, especially that Escape from Dol Guldur video, but that threat cost is so killer, and as soon as you get something like a plus one attack strength to the Hill Troll, um, even Mighty Aragorn is going to be killed in one hit. So yeah. uh, He's also very resource intensive, so if you've got a lot of leadership cards, if you keep pumping resources into Aragorn, uh, you're not really going to have anything left to spend. One combo that I really like with Aragorn that I didn't uh, get the chance to use in our series of videos is that card Common Cause. So just in case Aragorn at the end of the round has his action unused, you can go ahead and use that card for free to exhaust him, maybe ready Berivor on... Uh, you know, across the table to have her have someone draw two cards. Not nearly as potent since the errata on her, but definitely something to consider. Um, and another natural combo, I think, for him is the lore ally Hinamarth River Song. Um, at least in a single player game, just so you can know exactly what's coming off the encounter deck, uh, you can go ahead and scry that and see do I actually need to ready Aragorn? Can I commit him to a quest? And uh, all that good stuff there. So. How about you introduce our second hero, Matthew? Sure. Uh, our next hero is Theodred, and his threat cost is 8. His willpower is 1. His attack strength is 2. His defense strength is 1. And he has 4 hit points. Um, his uh, ability reads response. After Theodred commits to a quest, choose one hero committed to that quest. Add one resource to that hero's resource pool. Um, I think he's a decent hero. He certainly came in handy in, I think, all of our games. He's really a way to, if you're playing multi-spheres, to sort of balance out the fact that you may, if you only have, let's say, one tactics hero. Um, they're not going to be able to pay for a whole lot on their own, but with Theodred, if that hero is committed to the quest, he can be giving them extra resources to sort of overcome that handicap. Um, and I think that's probably his his greatest strength, at least to me. Right. I, I definitely think his natural combo, like you touched on with, uh, is Aragorn, mm -hmm. but he's great to kind of smooth out multi-sphere decks, toss resources across to another player. Uh, he definitely doesn't really excel at any one role. Like, he's pretty much a dedic dedicated quester because of his ability, but he's only got one willpower. Really rarely do I ever use him for attacking or defending, mm -hmm. but I do appreciate that with a lot of anti-questing character effects in this game, he's pretty sturdy with four hit points, so his threat isn't too bad. He's got some, you know, uh, I guess you could say wasted stat points in attack and defense, but overall, uh, Theodred is probably my go-to leadership character if I'm bothering to include that sphere. Yeah, I mean, certainly his low threat cost of 8 in some ways counterbalances Aragorn's high threat value of uh, 12. You know, one thing that I think this game doesn't do all that well yet is the use of traits. And this will probably be a recurring theme for me. Uh, but his traits are Noble, Rohan, and Warrior. I sort of skipped over that in my summary of his card, but it's because there's pretty much no use to any of those traits. There's a few cards that mention Rohan, uh, but not very many. I'm sure at some point we're going to get a deluxe expansion that focuses entirely on Rohan. We're just not there yet. I don't think there's a single card that deals with warriors yet. Um, or even noble, if I'm, my memory's serving me, but there might be some. I don't recall. But either way, the traits in this game, for almost every single character, are, are severely underused. Um, to the point of, I almost wonder sort of why they create them in the first place. Um, I guess it's just flexibility for the future. But yeah, his traits really, at this point, aren't offering him um, a lot of extra oomph. Sure. It seems like it's more character than, um, you know, game utility at this point. Right. But uh, just moving right along, Glowin is the third hero to round out the leadership sphere. He is a nine threat hero with two willpower, two attack, one defense, and four hit points. His uh, traits are dwarf and noble, and his response is after he suffers one damage, you add one resource to his resource pool for each point of damage he has just suffered. 
Um, I think he's a pretty interesting character. So long as you've got some sort of healing effects on the board, he can be a pretty steady source of income for you. So again, he really speaks to uh, leadership's ability to accelerate those resources. But in practice, taking damage can be really dangerous without the right support on the field. You know, after he takes maybe three damage, something like that, um, he's pretty risky with a lot of deal one damage to each exhausted character. He's probably being committed to the quest. So it it's uh, kind of a tricky prospect when it comes to striking that balance between questing and defending. Yeah, largely I agree. I think the Citadel Plate is sort of a natural for this hero um, to give him more hit points. That way you can generate more resources. Otherwise, though, I think leadership has better resource generation with Steward of Gondor. Um, maybe Glowin has um, slightly more utility once you get to the Kaza Doom um, set in its in its cycle because the Dwarf Synergy, one of the few traits that actually has a bunch of uh, good combos and whatnot, uh, he might be slightly improved. But to me, he's the weakest of the three core leadership heroes. Uh, doesn't see a whole lot of play in my decks um, post the core set. So I think it's a really cool idea. Just sort of there are better ways to generate resources. I think he definitely needs the most support out of the three heroes to make them work. Um, if you've got a daughter on the table, if you've got self-preservation, those are both really useful. I think Protector of Lorien is really useful on Glowin, just in case you are using him to defend, uh, in case you get an unplanned for shadow effect. I mean, you know, if at that point you're running leadership and lore, how likely is it that you're also running spirit? So... Um, definitely being able to adjust his defense value can help prevent some sort of untimely death, but uh, it's a dangerous prospect, to be sure. Yeah. Well, that's it for the heroes, so our allies are next, and the first one that we'll take a look at is the Guard of the Citadel. Um, uh, the Guard costs two, has one willpower, one attack strength, zero defense strength, and two hit points. Uh, no game text, and simply the traits Gondor and Warrior. Um, uh, you know, again, keeping my head sort of core set central, I think he's a decent ally in that he's a relatively cheap chump blocker. Um, otherwise, pretty vanilla. If I'm going to give any sort of silver lining, I think, to this ally, it's that the Heirs of Numenor set just came out, which is all about Gondor. So once that adventure uh, pack cycle wraps up, perhaps this ally will see more use or at least become better. Um, otherwise, it's one of those things I think he's really great for the core set for just sort of taking those attacks and letting your heroes do the rest, but otherwise not someone I would probably include too much uh, once better allies uh, are introduced. Sure. I mean, in the days of the core set when we were kind of uh, I guess it's fair to say struggling to scrape together 50 card decks, especially if you're not using three core sets like we are in our series. Um, I, When I was reviewing all of these cards, I made a plus and minus list, and pluses for Guard of the Citadel was just basic dude. He's a guy you can sit down on the table. He's a little bit expensive for what he does. Again, leadership doesn't really define itself as excelling at any one activity, so he's kind of a marginal quester, marginal attacker. He's not a great defender because he has no hit points, so even something like Eastern Crows can kill him outright or whittle him down. Um, I guess really the only natural combo with this guy is just that four Gondor, so if you can afford enough of these cheap allies on the table, boost them up to plus one attack strength, maybe give them an additional point of defense since he has that Gondor trait, uh, you could potentially swarm down a big enemy, but... What is there to say? He's your basic leadership blocker. Yeah, I sort of wish he had Sentinel. I think he'd be a little bit better. But, you know, and it almost seems like a natural fit for him. But he doesn't, so what can we do? Sure. And then I guess that ties into our first unique ally, which is Faramir. So whereas Guard of the Citadel was a very basic fellow, Faramir is anything but. So he weighs in at a cost of four, two willpower, one attack, two defense, and three hit points. He is a unique Gondor noble ranger, and his action is you can exhaust him to choose a player. Each character controlled by that player gets plus one willpower until the end of the phase. So it's a little bit strange that he's got that strong basic questing value just because 
you're almost going to be using him exclusively for his ability. So he's a pretty strong defender. He's relatively sturdy to have him exhausted during the quest phase. Um, but the more allies that you can get into play, and leadership is going to have resources aplenty, you can just turn one character, one player, into just a massive questing powerhouse. Yeah, uh, I think he's an expensive ally at four, certainly. But again, with leadership's ability to crank out those resources, he's not that expensive. He has hero-like stats. Um, I think his ability is great. And as with uh, the Guard of the Citadel, um, he has the Gondor trait. So he will probably, A, see a hero version of him, uh, himself in this Heirs of Numenor cycle. But even if he didn't, um, he's probably only going to get better and better. So I think he's a pretty solid uh, ally. Sure. And then I just uh, figured I'd mention a natural combo for Faramir here is the leadership event Ever Vigilant. So you can go ahead and pick one player uh, to activate this ability, then use Ever Vigilant to ready Faramir, perhaps um, pick a different player, perhaps just contribute him to the quest himself. So it just turns this really potent ally into just, uh, you know, something all the more ridiculous when it hits the table. Right. Um, our next ally is the son of Arnor. Um, he has a cost of three, uh, willpower zero, attack strength two, defense strength zero, and then hit points two. Um, his uh, trait is he's a Dunedain. Uh, his response is after son of Arnor interplays, uh, enters play, choose an enemy card in the staging area or currently engage with another player, engage that enemy. Um, I think he's a little used ally. There is no use at this point in the game for Dunedain, uh, the trait. Um, I think it's an interesting ability, but I think it really has limited usefulness. His stats are so-so. Again, in a corset-only sort of situation, he's an auto-include because you don't have that many choices. Outside of that, I can't see myself really, sadly, ever using this ally, especially given his, his cost. Yeah, the trick with this guy is he's got a decent attack power, but he's pretty expensive. His ability is very situational, so if one player is getting overwhelmed, you can potentially pull enemies away from them. There's a natural opportunity to put him to pretty good use during Journey Along the Anduin, where he can draw goblin snipers out of the staging area. Uh, but for the most part, it's a really situational ability. He's awfully expensive for what he does. He has absolutely no defense ability, no willpower, so he's really fragile. His only use is attacking, and as soon as there's something to replace this guy, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. And I suppose that brings us into our next ally, which is the Snowborn Scout. At a cost of one, zero willpower, zero attack, one defense, and one hit point, Another Rohan character, also a scout, and its response is once it enters play, pick a location, place one progress token on that location. And for as simple as this guy seems, it's probably one of my favorite allies in the core set. So it is cheap as hell, you can dump it into play, it serves uh, its role as a chump blocker character to absorb anything from a Nazgul attack to a hill troll attack very, very well. Uh, very affordable defender. It's got one defense, so potentially it can defend against something like an Eastern Crows countless times uh, until you get some sort of nasty shadow effects. And if you happen to play four Gondor, enough of these can maybe swarm down a larger opponent. But uh, it's not obviously blowing me away, but it's, I think, a great staple ally. Uh, I think my opinion's a little different. I can't say he's my favorite. Um, he's got that darn Rohan trait, which just has had no development yet. It may get better. His his stats are pathetic, I think. Um, he's They're mainly useful. used for <laughs> right. He's used for his ability. I don't disagree with you there. Um, but he's certainly not as powerful as a Northern Tracker or Lorien guide. And I don't think that leadership is all that horrible at questing that it would necessarily need this ally. Um, if this was maybe a tactics ally, I think he'd, I would probably rank him a lot higher in that tactics has a much more difficult time in dealing with locations. Um, but, you know, all things considered, you do play him for his ability. He is a very cheap chump blocker for some sort of big enemy, and, it, and that's probably enough to include him in, in many decks, at least until some better cards are introduced into our card pool. 
Sure. And something that I like about that ability is it allows you to take free advantage of, let's say, if you don't have a, a you know, a pocket Gandalf in your hand, you can go ahead and sneak attack the Snowborn, Cout, uh, Snowborn Scout just to try and snipe some locations in the staging area. If you do have a player with Northern Tracker on the board that's making some steady progress, um, you know, one little snipe here and there can end up saving you quite a bit of willpower in the long term. Um, stand and Fight also works really well for Snowborn Scout, so it's just a really cheap character that has a little bit of a useful ability. Maybe get rid of some miserable Gladden fields. I think in the absolute best case scenario, you'd be getting rid of that five threat, one progress token brown lands. Mm. But uh, mm -hmm. the Snowborn Scout, he is what he is. Right. He's got his role. Yeah, you know, I, I don't hate him. I'm just not sure I would say my favorite, but I, I, th I think he's good. Uh, uh, on the other hand, though, I would probably say this might be my least favorite, which is the Silver Load Archer. Um, cost of three, willpower of one, attack strength of two, uh, defense strength of zero, hit uh, one hit point. He's an archer in a Sylvan. Again, not too much use yet with those traits. Uh, he is ranged, however. Um, just a few comments here. He's an expensive ally. I guess you're paying for the ranged. Um, his stats are only so-so. Um, you know, I, as you guys have seen in our videos, I'm sort of the tactics guy. I wouldn't be surprised if I play that sphere for the entirety of our series because it's my favorite. Um, but, you know, so I love attacking, but I actually think Sentinel in many ways is a more useful abil ability than ranged. Um, so I'm not sure I'd want to pay three for a ranged ally that kind of has crappy stats. Um, certainly there's enemies that you have to have range to deal with, and then he would become much more be uh, better used in those particular quests. But, you know, thinking of quests or the game in, in general, i just not a huge fan of the uh, Silver Load Archer. I think the thing about Silver Load Archer is his natural comparison is the Tactics Ally Horseback Archer, which is one less willpower, the same attack strength, one additional defense, and one additional hit point. So Silver Load Archer is a little bit better in some ways than a character like Son of Arnor, where he has that point of willpower, so if there's nothing on the on the playing surface to attack, he could be used for marginal questing effects, but he's also only got one hit point, which puts him at risk of being killed outright by Evil Storm or the Necromancer's Reach, any number of effects like that. So it seems a little bit expensive for an extremely frail ally. Sometimes the leadership player isn't going to be the one that's you know, uh, pulling in all the allies and then maybe range should be helpful, but I don't know. I don't think we've had the opportunity to play this guy in our videos, but it seems like he's a little bit over expensive for what he does. Yeah. And speaking of expensive for what he does, <laughs> our next ally is Longbeard Orc Slayer. At a cost of four for zero willpower, another two attack, one defense, and three hit points. This time it is a dwarf warrior, and after Longbeard Orc Slayer enters play, deal one damage to each orc enemy in play. I do like the fact that it's a more useful blocker than a lot of the allies we've seen so far. It's got a much more... Uh, useful pool of hit points on it. It does have pretty low stats, I feel, for the cost. Um, if you take a look at Faramir, even though he's unique, he's got a total of eight stat points, whereas this guy has a lowly six. And then that ability concerns me just because uh, when you look at all the cards that he can be combined with, things like Swift Strike, Fallon, Gondorian Spearman, and all those direct damage effects, there's no real convenience easy, you know, mass orc killing. Uh, Dolgulder orcs, for example, has three hit points, so even a Longbeard Orc Slayer and Gondorian Spearman, that's still not sufficient to outright kill that, so... Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I'm just sort of channeling Brandon's playstyle here, but I, I like this card, right? Sort of, it's kind of like Boromir, uh, the hero that we'll get to much later in the series, but, uh, you know, he sort of does instant damage. You mentioned that he combos well with Fallon, and I think that's correct. Um, I also think he's an excellent, uh, excellent candidate for sneak attack. Uh, there are, of course, are better candidates, perhaps Gandalf for one, but I don't think this would be a bad character to sneak attack. Um, especially once we get into the Khazad Doom cycle where there's a bunch of orcs and they tend to swarm. 
And, um, you know, and again, he's a dwarf. So in Kaza Doom, there's a lot of dwarf synergy. I honestly don't think this is a guy I played with a lot, but I still think he's cool <laughs> just because of his ability. So he is expensive. His ability, you know, would, would be very handy if there's a bunch of orcs in play, especially those little tiny uh, peckish type ones in Kaza Doom. But um, I, I think I agree by and large that this is an ally that will probably sit in the binder most of the time even if I think he's pretty cool. Yeah, it just seems a little bit cost prohibitive to me. And I think the deal breaker for this guy is it's almost impossible for me not to say Longbeard Dwarf Slayer. <laughs> right. And, you know, speaking of cost prohibitive, that leads us to Brock Iron Fist. Um, our most expensive ally so far, in fact, he's even more expensive than Gandalf with a cost of six. His willpower is two. His attack strength is two. His defense strength is one, and his hit points are four. So his abilities are, again, nothing to sneeze at. They're hero-level um, uh, stats here. Um, uh, traits, dwarf and warrior, his text is that after a dwarf hero you control leaves play, put Brock Iron Fist into play from your hand. Well, what I you know could jokingly say about this character is in uh, the quest where I was losing heroes left and right, I would have loved to have had him in my hand. Um, but otherwise, I think his ability just isn't that great, given the, the cost. I think his stats are fine. But even for sort of the sphere that's great at resource generation, I still think his cost is perhaps too much uh, for his sort of lackluster ability. The thing about this guy for me is taking a look at his stats, they're identical to Glowen. So if you're only playing leadership, he's the only dwarf hero you could possibly control. If you've got tactics, then uh, you've got leadership, and Gimli's stats are better than this guy. But Broke Iron Fist, his ability basically depends on at some point your hero is going to die. So Glowen is certainly very fragile, being designed to take... Uh, damage, mm -hmm. you know, maybe Glowen could easily leave play, but it just seems like building a deck based on uh, planning for a hero to die is just a little bit strange, and taking a look at this actual character when you compare it to an equivalently costed unique ally like Bjorn, um, Brock Iron Fist only has a total of 9 stat points while Bjorn has 13, and it just seems so expensive for an ability that would hopefully, you know, never come into play. And I really can't think of any natural combos for him, so no, I don't. I don't really know what to say. Brock Iron Fist, apart from my very first plays in this game, uh, certainly a character that I've pretty much avoided, even in the Kaza Doom cycle. Yep, uh, and you know, perhaps it's a good thing that there was only one of him in the uh, in the course. Of right, exactly. And I guess now that we've covered our allies, we're going to go ahead and transition to attachments. And the very first attachment we're going to cover is something that makes the leadership sphere practically worth including to uh, a deck by itself. And it is Steward of Gondor. So it is a unique attachment. It has the traits Gondor and Title, and it reads, Attached to a hero, attached hero gains the Gondor trait, and its action is Exhaust, Steward of Gondor, to add two resources to attached hero's resource pool. So when we talked about Theodred being able to smooth out uh, resources in a multi-sphere deck or between two players, Steward of Gondor just absolutely takes the cake, in that it pays for itself as soon as you play it, and instead of generating three resources a turn, you're instantly doing five for the rest of the game. It is absolutely absurd. Yeah, it's a fantastic event. I think it's one of the core cards that still remains relevant today. Perhaps it will remain relevant for years to come. And perhaps this, uh, this fantastic event, or attachment I should say, will get even better uh, in the current cycle. It's granting the Gondor trait, and if we have enough um, event cards that deal with the Gondor trait, and we already have some, it could make uh, the hero it's attached to even better at whatever that card tends to do. So I, th I think that's the line that's gotten no attention, right? Attached hero gains the Gondor trait because there hasn't been a need for it, but uh, it could, like I said, get even better in the current cycle. Yeah, at this point, the only real benefit to the Gondor trait is if someone plays for Gondor, you get an additional point of defense. Um, Steward of Gondor, when I think of Magic the Gathering's Power 9, like the original 9 cards that are mm -hmm. just insanely powerful that 
couldn't really do anything but make a deck better, this is probably one of LOTR LCG's contenders for a spot like that. Absolutely. And then the final attachment for leadership, they only get two, is uh, Calabrian Stone. Uh, let's see, it's an artifact and an item, and it, its text reads, attached to a hero, and it's a restricted item. Uh, the attached hero gets plus two willpower, and if the attached hero is Aragorn, he also gains a spirit resource icon. I also think this is a very good um, attachment with a great effect. Um, of course, it's best on Aragorn, but and I think even in our video series, we might have put this on some folks other than Aragorn. Be I think we had, I think I had it on Theodred at one point because he's always going to be questing, and I was questing for three instead of for one. Uh, so I think it's a it's a pretty darn good uh, attachment. Yeah, I think the price is absolutely right. I like paying two resources for, say, two attack, two willpower. We don't really see too much of the two for two uh, when it comes to questing in the uh, core set, so I love that leadership attachment. It is too bad that it's unique, but I think it's a fantastic quest booster. Of course, if you're playing spirit and leadership, if you've got Aragorn in play, not only is it generating uh, additional willpower for you, but it's also smoothing out your spheres, so it's helping to pay for the ton of spirit cards in the core set that are just auto-includes in your deck, so I think Calabrian Stone is a fantastic card. So uh, that's it for our attachments in the leadership sphere, and we're on to the events. So the first one here is Ever Vigilant. It has a cost of one, and its uh, action reads, choose and ready one ally card. Um, I certainly love cheap events. It only costs one. Although I think the ability is somewhat limited, certainly in the core set, though it might get better in some of the later sets. There aren't that many allies you'd want to be readying, paying to ready, I don't think, but certainly the ones that come later where you can maybe scry the encounter deck or scry your deck or whatever else, this might be a helpful event. I don't think it's one I include very often, because if I want to ready uh, any character, it's typically a hero. Yeah, it, it definitely can be a little bit tricky to set up. Let's say, I think Gandalf is probably one of the best options for this, right. where you can commit him to the quest, ready him to attack, ready him to defend, maybe expensive allies such as Faramir, like we already covered. The problem with that, though, is let's say you have, say, three copies of Gandalf, two or three copies of Faramir in your deck, because he's unique, uh, then you have to hope that you have one of these in your hand at the right time. Leadership doesn't really have, well, it has next to no card draw at all, so it seems like, you know, everything has to kind of align to be able to use this card to best ability, so right. um, you're really probably not going to be getting two defenses or something like that out of most leadership allies, so... Sometimes it's good, but it's it could be okay sometimes. Right. And I suppose that brings us to our next event, which is Common Cause. At a cost of zero, and it reads simply, Action, exhaust one hero you control to choose and ready a different hero. So I already talked about this a little bit with Aragorn, but if you've got some unused actions at the end of the round, you can certainly... Uh, change things a little bit. I think Common Cause is best used with um, heroes such as maybe Dune here or Eleanor, where if you're not scrying, if you don't know what's going to come off the encounter deck, if you were planning on Eleanor maybe canceling some wind revealed effects or defending and that doesn't end up happening, maybe you can go ahead and target her with this ability in order to, say, give Gimli another action or give Aragorn another attack. Um, and the same goes with Dune here. If there's nothing in the staging area for him to attack, then he's not really doing anyone any good. Right. I think I basically agree. It's a cheap event. Of course, I love that. But the ability is limited. It might be useful with someone who has unexpected courage attached to them. Uh, and you haven't had used unexpected courage yet that round. Uh, you could, uh, you know, ready and exhaust them with that to ready someone else. Or, you know, there was a lot of times in our videos where I had Legolas or Gimli just ready because no enemies came off the encounter deck for me to, to bash. Um, and so if I could have exhausted them to perhaps ready one of yours or something, that, that maybe could have been useful. Otherwise, I don't think this is a card that I include in too many decks. Um, just, you know, not my fave. Uh, the next event for Gondor, we've referenced it a few times uh, so far in this review series. Uh, it's got a cost of two. Its action reads, until the end of phase, all characters get plus one attack strength. 
All Gondor characters also get plus one defense strength until the end of phase. I think it's a decent effect. The cost is, I don't want to say high, but it, it, it's not it's not zero or one, unlike some of the, the more powerhouse events. Um, it will perhaps, again, as I keep saying, get better with Heirs of Numenor, now that the Gondor trait is going to get a lot of love and attention, much like the Dwarf trait did in um, the Khazad Doom cycle. Otherwise, this is not uh, an event that I would use too much, especially because it's giving you plus attack and plus defense, which most characters aren't going to need both in the same round. Um, I'd rather probably just pay one for plus one attack or one for plus one defense rather than getting both. But yeah, it's not horrible. Um, I look forward to seeing what sort of use this card may be getting in the next couple of months. Yeah. Well, for Gondor makes me think of the tactics version of this, which is uh, Blade Mastery, where it's, you mm -hmm. know, one character gets plus one attack, plus one defense for just a cost of one. I do like that if you have a lot of characters in play, it's not, you know, just heroes, it's not just allies, they do all get that boost, so even things like Snowborn Scouts suddenly have one attack strength, you can kind of swarm down enemies, maybe if your teammate is willing to throw you some wandering toques or vice versa, um, you know, you can really just swarm one big enemy like a hill troll, I do like that it scales based on the number of characters in play, um, like I said, zero attack is suddenly useful again, but if you're really used to using your cheap allies like Snowborn Scout as chump blockers, it means that you're not really going to have a lot of effect from this card. So sometimes it'll make a little bit of a difference, sometimes it won't make enough. And really, I think that defense bonus is more often than not completely negligible. So Right. I, I guess the what makes this card better than some others that is all characters, not just your own. So if you're going to be doing uh, the defending and you have, a, you have a Gondor deck or something, all your guys get plus one defense strength and your buddy's going to be attacking, well, then they can take use of the uh, the attack strength boost here. Um, but, you know, other than that, again, I think it's a wait and see. As far as the core set only, meh, yeah. not the best. I suppose just worth mentioning, the Gondor heroes uh, that we've seen so far in the core set are Eleanor, Denethor, um, and that's it. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really all. Yeah. But that does lead into something that's, well, potentially another Power 9 card, I guess you could call it. Mm -hmm. Sneak Attack. So a one-cost leadership event with action. Put one ally card into play from your hand. At the end of the phase, if that ally is still in play, return it to your hand. So we already talked about the natural combo being something like Snowborn Scout. Bounce it onto the table, it maybe snipes a location, returns to your hand to be played later. Maybe you can drop uh, the Longbeard Orc Slayer and bounce it back, play it, maybe kill some enemies. Um, and of course Gandalf is the just powerhouse combo with this. So drop him into play, commit him to the quest, have him defend or attack. He's very likely to survive with his four defense and four hit points. Um, his abilities are extremely potent, and being able to play Gandalf for one resource is practically game-breaking. Yeah, definitely one of the best leadership events. Uh, as you mentioned, it's great with Gandalf. I think it could be good with Bjorn, which is a, a tactics ally we'll get to later. And this card continues to be great in that there's a bunch of other allies that we'll be reviewing in upcoming adventure packs and deluxe expansions that, that fit this card perfectly. Certainly. And when you mention Bjorn, it's worth noting uh, that somewhere in our FAQ it mentions that when two effects are basically triggering at the same time. So let's say you use Sneak Attack uh, to put Bjorn into play. At the end of the phase, he's going to be returning to your hand. If you trigger his ability, I believe that reads, at the end of the phase, uh, shuffle him back into your deck. The first player actually decides the order in which those effects resolve. So if you'd rather just have Bjorn with his colossal aid attack strength drop back into your hand, you're certainly welcome to do that. So, yeah, very, very powerful event. Speaking of popping back into your hand, uh, we have Valiant Sacrifice with a cost of one. Its response read, as, uh, after an ally leaves play, that card's controller draws two cards. So this obviously, I think, combos very well with uh, Sneak Attack. Um, I think it's a nice effect. It also works very well with the Horn of Gondor, um, a tactics attachment. I think it's a great card, especially if you can sort of build a deck around allies entering and exiting play. Um, I think it's pretty good. 
Yeah, I, I do like that this is finally some way for leadership to get card advantage. I think it's the only card draw effect that we've seen so far in our core leadership cards. Uh, I do like that you can trigger as many Valiant Sacrifices as you like. Like if you're holding three of these in hand, you can play all three in response to one ally leaving play. I guess the only thing that's of any concern to me at all is I've actually had a lot of experience with this being a little bit difficult to use uh, once you're actually playing a game. Like our Escape from Dal Guldur, I believe I started the game with this in my hand and I was just surprised that I think over the course of the entire game only I believe one ally ended up leaving play. So, right. It's there's certain as you say there's certain quests that it's probably better in than others. Those quests where you know you're going to be chump blocking a massive enemy all the time. Great card. Quests where it's maybe more questing or something. Uh, not as much battle or attacking. Uh, maybe this is uh, less useful. Right. And then another possible downside is it's a little bit sloppy. So. Um, you know, if I'm really desperate to get cards and you're the character that loses an ally, right. maybe you've already got 10, 12 cards in your hand and this is just, uh, you know, a little bit overkill. Yeah. But I guess that brings us to our final event for this video. It is Grim Resolve, the most expensive event from leadership, weighing in a, at a cost of five, and it is quite simply action, ready, all characters in play. So this can obviously be an extremely potent effect. It's also expensive to match it, uh, but it gives you a huge action advantage. Um, I think the perfect scenario is to have every player in the game commit all of their characters to the quest. Then you can drop this into play. All characters become ready if a lot of effects like the Necromancer's Reach or, uh, let's say, in A Journey to Rosgabel, Exhaustion go off. All of the characters are automatically immune to that. If you've got, say, Faramir in play, he's got a free action to target players, to boost their uh, questing characters. So it's, uh, you know, obvi obviously a huge effect during combat, too. It can be just spectacular, having every character defend, and instead of getting overwhelmed next turn, they can turn right around and slay the, you know, oncoming hordes of orcs and goblins. <laughs> Right. I think it's a very powerful effect. I think it can have many uses, right? If you need to defend a bunch and then attack back to, to uh, you know, get rid of those enemies you're engaged with, that could be another good use. And you're right. It's a very high cost at five. Though, you know, when it comes to leadership, I'm not always super concerned with cost because they are the sphere that's best at resource generation, whether it's Theodred, whether it's Steward of Gondor, whether it's some of the cards that are coming up in the Adventure Packs and the other Deluxe Expansions. There are lots of ways for leadership to generate resources. However, I basically think this is sort of a save our skins maneuver that shouldn't be an auto-include in every deck. Um, it might just be there if you're really struggling with a quest and you need something, and, and this could be the card that could help you overcome a quest you're having difficulty with. Sure. And I guess now that we've uh, gone through all the different leadership heroes, allies, attachments, and events, uh, are, is there anything that maybe stands out now that we've kind of dug through each and every specific card as any particular strengths or weaknesses of the leadership sphere? I think you said it best at the, at the outset of this video. They're sort of a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. Um, Steward of Gondor, though, the resource regeneration sort of idea, I think is leadership's best strength, which I think fits into sort of their characterization that we started off with. Uh, they're sort of leading and inspiring, though by generating resources, maybe they're doing more by bribing people to come along on their little adventure. But uh, I, it's a sphere that I definitely liked at the beginning. Uh, I think it's a sphere that's come around and gotten a little bit better after having a, a low point. But um, I, I think it's fairly well-rounded in the core set. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think I was never really at a loss for actions. Um, I was able to do a lot of good willpower boosts, you know, uh, get little additional effects here and there from sneak attack, valiant sacrifice. Uh, so lots of readying of characters, lots of additional willpower bonuses. So all in all, I feel like leadership is pretty strong. Again, it doesn't absolutely dominate any one uh, role in this game, but it's definitely worth including, and I think in the core set it's uh, pretty powerful. So, any closing thoughts, Matthew? Uh, no, not at all. 
All right. Well, I <laughs> think that about sums it up. So as always, thank you guys very much for checking out the very first of our uh, sphere review videos. Next up, we're going to be covering the tactic sphere. So until next time, be sure to like this video or subscribe to our channel if you liked what I saw. Uh, liked what you saw. Thanks if so you've thought of any other uses for some of these cards that we forgot or just uh, omitted, spaced out, feel free to leave those in the comments below with any sort of comments or criticism. Uh, we very much look forward to reading all of your comments. So thank you guys for watching and see you again soon.